Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Raymond Gilpin. I head the strategy analysis and research uh, team at the UNDP's Regional Bureau for Africa in New York. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, conversation about COVID-19 disruption <clears throat> and innovation in Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we know that um, COVID-19 has made the last year and a half very challenging across the world. Um, but in Africa in particular, um, COVID-19 has hit really, really, really hard, not just in terms of the number of people who have been affected um, by COVID-19, but by its very, very serious um, socioeconomic um, consequences. Um, we know that um, Africa accounts for 17% of the world's population, but only 3% of the number of cases and 4% of the fatalities. Um, this is um, a statistic that um, you know, bears a lot of um, testimony to the um, immediate responses of many African go governments and communities to contain the health side of the um, pandemic. But the socioeconomic side has been pretty dire. According to estimates by the World Bank, some 40 million Africans will be pushed back into poverty. The World Food, World Food Program estimates that 168 million Africans became food insecure because of the pandemic. The International Energy um, Agency um, estimates that 100 million Africans who are able to afford sustainable energy could no longer do so because they can't afford to anymore because of the impacts of COVID. We look across the world and we see that currently only 5%, less than 5% of Africans are vaccinated. Uh, this compares unfavorably with other parts of the world that are tending towards 10 times that amount. And so the question then becomes, how do we understand the COVID-19 pandemic? not just from a perspective of these socioeconomic indicators, but also looking to see how it impacts youth in particular and what we can and how we can better understand the contributions that Africa's young people could make to address um, COVID-19. Um, today we have um, two excellent panelists who are going to help us unpack a lot of these issues. Um, first, we have um, Dr. Zoe Marx, um, who we are very uh, fortunate to have. She's a lecturer in public policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School, and she um, has had a significant amount of um, experience researching um, socioeconomic conflict and security issues across the African continent. Um, she's worked um, with a number of um, governmental, non-governmental, and UN um, agencies across, um, the, uh, across the continent. And so she brings to this conversation deep knowledge and a lot of experience. I'm going to turn the, um, the, um, the um, uh, virtual uh, microphone over to her first and ask her to you know, talk us through how COVID-19 has impacted Africa in particular, and what she thinks um, African um, countries could learn from the rest of the world in preparing not just to overcome the pandemic, but also to make the most of some of the opportunities for innovation and creativity that COVID has, um, has um, presented. And so over to you, Zoe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Raymond, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, YALI is one of my favorite kind of uh, consortiums of, of young people making positive change, um, not just in Africa, but in ripple effects around the world. And so, as Raymond mentioned, I wanted to sort of kick us off with the global perspective so that I can then pass it to Alfred, who'll be giving us a country and community level on the ground perspective. And my global perspective is not because the rest of the world matters more for our conversation today, but really because I think it's it's best to understand Africa in its global context rather than just in a in a sort of narrow context as though Africa is inherently different. 
than other regions and continents. Um, so to begin with the global impact of COVID, current has the global economy $28 trillion. Now, Africa's share of this economic impact, the economic cost of COVID is, is much smaller, but it still amounts to the first decline in regional GDP. So that's the sort of standard measure for thinking about the health and the, and the growth of the economy. Um, it's actually the first decline we've seen in 25 years. And so the headline, uh, because we're in a, in a world in which money moves power, money moves opportunities, the headline is really that um, the immediate impacts that we're most confronted with across the African region are economic impacts from COVID. And this is for two reasons. It's one, because of the disruptions to the global trade and supply chains, the way that imports and exports have been sort of stifled, especially during the early stages of, of the COVID pandemic in early 2020, but in ways that continue today. And then the other reason is because countries within Africa have had to put their own lockdowns on the local population, on cross-border movements. And so this has affected regional economic integration. The other major challenge that this leads to is a knock-on effect for the revenues for countries. So that means the national government has less money, about 5% less money on average, but across 55 countries, there's a lot of variation, but roughly 5% less revenue to spend on the population, to spend on things like road improvements, to spend on things like healthcare and education, security. And so it's not just about sort of the, the flows of wealth and money and material goods. It's also about the way that that affects our governments and their ability to invest in social welfare and other programs. Now, there have been a few sort of bright spots that have happened globally that don't necessarily affect African countries in the same way. So one bright spot was that we saw for the first time a massive reduction in carbon emissions in the first half of 2020 because flights stopped going between countries. Production at major factories that were leading to pollution and global climate change were curtailed. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that happened is there was a massive increase in upscaling of carbon emissions in the second half of 2020. So we had, because of COVID, the proof of concept that we could dramatically cut carbon emissions. We know that climate change is affecting African countries hugely disproportionately to other regions of the world and disproportionate to their own carbon emissions. But we also saw wealthy and industrial countries sort of ramp back up their pollution, which is leading to environmental exacerbation. The second thing that happened is we saw that there was an opportunity for things like mutual aid for transferring money to people who needed it most. Um, in my communities in the United States, I live in Boston, Massachusetts, we saw mutual aid networks happening where neighbors were giving money to other neighbors who lost their jobs or who were sort of uh, put out of work as a result of the shutdown. Now, in the second half of 2020, again, we saw that wealth and inequality and stock markets were massively increasing while people who had lost their jobs were struggling to get access to jobs. And this month we're seeing people are being evicted again. And so we've seen that there's been these sort of glimmers of hope that then get shut back down at the global level. Now that hasn't happened within Africa where there've been African challenges, the really specific challenges to the region are the global inequalities or global apartheid of the vaccine regime. And so we've seen that initially it was protective personal equipment, PPE, so masks, robes, other sort of sanitary devices that were necessary for healthcare providers and ventilators for people who had severe COVID. African countries had a huge, huge access problem. And so what happened was people started, as many of you know, pivoting to create these products locally within the country because the supply chains were shut down. So this emphasized the sort of nimbleness, the agility, the flexibility of local production capacity to respond to this immediate gap. But now we're seeing a sort of second gap, which is that African countries, as Dr. Gilpin mentioned, have lack of access to equitable vaccines. And so less than one vaccine per 100 people in Africa corresponds with 15 vaccines per 100 people in the global average. And so these global averages really reflect the sort of second wave of challenges, which is how can African countries work together, which has been their strength throughout COVID, how can they work together to emphasize the sort of rebuilding and reconstruction, not only on the medical side in terms of vaccine access, but also on the economic side. And so where I want to end my comments is really thinking about optimism, recommendations, and the role of young people. 
First, one of the things that African countries have done better than any other region in the world, even better than Europe, in my opinion, is coordination through the Africa CDC with uh, monitoring the spread of COVID, but also providing sort of pooled access to things like PPE and other response items for COVID and now increasingly coordinated and pooled access to vaccines. I think African countries use their sort of 20 years of the African Union, 60 years of the Organization of African Union, this long legacy of political Pan-Africanism to build trust so that countries could work together. And then the second thing that African countries have sometimes been um, underrated on is their ability to actually use outside sources like NGOs, like foundations, the power brokers who might look like they control the purse strings, African governments and African civil society have become very savvy at using these resources while still controlling where they're spent and what they're good for. And so I think that the African leadership on the ground has been remarkable. The communication has been very clear and coordinated. And where young people have been particularly important is ensuring that there's nothing lost in translation and fighting against misinformation about the basics of coronavirus, coronavirus transmission, coronavirus awareness. You know, I was working with my students this past fall, trying to track all of the uh, musicians and artists and performers who had launched coronavirus songs to begin to educate the local population, particularly people who don't have access to high levels of scientific literacy, who might be susceptible to misinformation. So that's the first thing that young people have been essential for, is actually getting the word out about coronavirus and fighting against misinformation campaigns. The second thing that young people have been really important for, and this actually, it, this is something that we've seen over and over again. I work a lot in West Africa. So after the Ebola epidemic, we saw that young people were at the front lines of holding the government accountable and demanding transparency. Again, particularly in countries with authoritarian tendencies or where there's been a crackdown on access to the internet, young people have been at the front lines of maintaining space for democracy and demanding accountability and responsibility from their leadership. And so these two things together, providing access to information and then holding space for human rights and democracy is really, I think, the, the foundation of all else that's good across Africa. And so I know that we'll have time to talk more about some of the specifics of innovation, entrepreneurship, the role of young people in gaining access to dignified work and economic development. But I really wanted to focus my comments initially on the fact that Africa's multilateralism is its greatest strength. And young people are the, are the sort of um, the keys to success for countries to, to put their people first, because we all know that without people holding their governments to account, the government will very quickly become an old boys club and it won't actually work for the benefit of all citizens. And so that's why I think we're all here today is because you are the next generation of leaders and to get there that you have to hold the current leaders accountable. And we've seen that continue throughout COVID despite the emergencies, despite the hardship. Uh, thank you very much, um, Zoe, and uh, thanks for those remarks. I'd just like to remind all our viewers that if you have a question for in either one of our uh, panelists, um, please write them in the chat room and we'll get back to them um, subsequently. Um, you you uh, mentioned um, a, a, a number of, um, a, a, a number of uh, ways in which um, COVID has impacted African economies. You also talked about some recommendations, um, what Africa is doing well and what Africa could probably do better, and particularly within from the framing of the um, youth um, contribution and perspective. Um, let me ask you a follow-up question, um, because we did a study at UNDP looking at the long-term macroeconomic um, impacts of COVID, and we found a number of things. I'd just like to highlight three. Um, the first is we found out that there is no single COVID story in Africa. Um, country, co countries that um, re rely on tourism were affected differently from countries that, re that, that rely on uh, mineral exports. We also found out that the impacts are going to linger for much longer than we think. Um, by 2020, uh, by 2030, for instance, uh, the number of um, indirect health-related mortality, um, deaths that are indirectly related to COVID, uh, would double to about 250,000 people a year, according to our modeling. And the third thing we found out is that trade patterns would shift. 
um, meaning that um, African countries are going to be trading less with the countries and organizations they currently do, do business with, and the Africa continental free trade area arrangement will have some impact here. Um, what does this tell you about, um, you know, you talked about um, the um, youth being the vanguard for communication, etc. How should they become more involved given these diverse contexts in terms of COVID? If you can just do about a couple of minutes on this. Sure, yeah. No, I think, let me start with the macroeconomic picture, which, I mean, you're, you're the expert because you've been involved in, in all of this research and report writing. But, you know, I, I completely agree with your analysis. It's definitely the case that countries have their own specializations within the global economy, within regional economies, even within a given country, there's enormous diversity, right? So one of the other countries that I work in is in Nigeria, where you've got an oil economy in one region, you've got a pastoral economy in other regions, you've got a tech hub, you know, and so there's, there's a a sort of way that this happens at even the country level that's important to be mindful of. Um, and it matters because for those of us who live in countries with economic diversity internally within our, our so-called borders, um, we can see that what we need is we need that diversity for our country's economies to be healthy. We need to have a healthy agricultural sector. Ideally, we have some mineral resources that provide you know, high level of efficient revenues to the government. And then we also wanna have tech and innovation and finance and and even tourism, right? Um, for smaller countries, as you mentioned, I'm thinking, for example, of Gambia, which is a very... Uh, Gabon, for instance, there actually the region becomes the source of economic diversity. And I think one of the things that we saw the risk of in the early stages of 2020 as a result of COVID was as borders closed and countries were vulnerable to these shocks to the global supply chain and global exports and imports, um, countries couldn't make it alone. And so I think the African continental free trade area has seen not only a, a launch at the hardest time you can possibly launch it in, into integration project, which is in the midst of a pandemic that leads to, to these sort of regional and national shutdowns. But we've also seen the best possible case for why that regional integration economically is essential. African countries are largely too small to be self-sufficient independently. And so by working with complementarity, you can get regional economic diversification and integration that can really help not only the region, but the, the constituent regions, the nine regional economic communities that make up the AU, um, they can themselves work for one another in, in a broader global economy. And so what that means for young people is first and foremost, understand the power of regional integration. Maybe it means that you are from one country and you go to university in a neighboring country because you see that they excel at education. That's one of their sort of micro industries. And then that gives you your own regional perspective. So if you're from Uganda, you go to Nairobi for university and then you go work in Kigali, you already become this sort of sub-regional citizen or global citizen within an African stage. And I think the more that we see that type of mobility through things like the African continental free trade area, the more that we'll have these sort of integrated solutions and networks of innovation that respond to crises like COVID, but also that fuel our economic development going forward. Uh, thank you so much, um, Zoe. Um, we seem to be having some technical um, problems um, getting um, our second speaker on, but as soon as that's resolved, um, we would have him on to um, offer his perspectives from a country and community perspective. Um, I think we do have him on. Um, let me just find out. Um, Alfred, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, no, thank you so much for joining us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Alfred Kankuzi is an alum of Yali, and he's also a serial entrepreneur. He is founder and CEO of a number of enterprises, um, including Legal Wallet, which is an app that helps improve um, legal literacy across the continent, um, status mindset, and PESA so social venture. Um, we're very um, fortunate to have him um, when, um, I when uh, technology uh, allows. 
And when he does come on, we'll be asking him to talk to us a little bit about what he's seeing about not just the impact of COVID at a country and community level, but also what some of the opportunities are, what some of the low hanging fruits that um, the young people in Africa can hold on to. And um, Alfred, I see that you are on. Um, could you give us a country perspective? How is um, COVID unfolding, uh, the country perspective in Africa, and what um, opportunities do you see existing for the youth across the continent? Uh, thank you, Dr. Zoe Max. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19, it has, I would say, it has come as a surprise to most of the nations, I would say, from communities uh, and countries. Um, the first point being that what COVID-19 has done has made uh, countries to realize that they're supposed to be. Okay, we seem to have lost um, Alfred again. Um, but um, let me just go back to um, something that you did mention, um, Zoe. Oh, I see Alfred is back. Yes, I keep blacking. Yes, if you could turn your video off, maybe we'll solve the um, bandwidth, bandwidth issue. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I, I was saying when it comes to COVID-19, uh, to most of the countries, it has come as, and communities, it has come as a Okay, unfortunately, um, he's um, switching. Um, he's um, switching in and, and out. But let me go back to you, um, Zoe. You mentioned um, that um, Africa's youth have been at the forefront of learning, leadership, coordination, and also demanding accountability. Um, one area in which um, you know accountability is sorely needed is with the vaccines. Um, the recent um, study by the um, RAND Corporation um, noted that the impact to the global economy, if we don't have the continent catching up in terms of vaccines, um, is $1.2 trillion a year. Um, they broke it down showing that um, the US, for instance, would lose one, um, $16 billion every year. And um, they also, in that same report, uh, mentioned that the return on, of investment of $1 of investment in the um, vaccines in um, developing countries like in, across Africa is $4.8. For every $1 that you invest, you get $4.8 back. Is there a case to be made for global advocacy for um, equality of access and affordability of vaccines in Africa? And what role do you think the youth could play in this regard? Absolutely. I mean, nothing makes my blood boil faster than thinking about the lack of access to vaccines across the African region. I mean, I, there's, I think, a difficult question about the logistics of actually having the youth be, to use your turn of phrase, the vanguard for advocating for vaccine access, because right now, the vaccine access is so small and the result is that it's really dedicated for medical professionals and frontline service providers and then for the elderly, right? And so when you think about young people, young people are not the high risk, not the highest risk or most vulnerable population in the context of COVID. And so if large scale sort of phase three and onwards, as they're calling it in the um, strategic outline for the Africa CDC, if the phase three vaccinations aren't available until 2022, so that's when young people would have access, then it means not only are young people compromised in terms of the public health precautions they have to take in their day-to-day -day lives and their work, um, but it also means that it's hard to advocate for something you can't yet get yourself. Right? So ideally for young people to be the, the kind of advocates and, and disseminators of information about the public health benefits, the economic benefits, but really just the herd immunity benefits of, of having everyone in society be vaccinated. If you get that kind of goodwill going, you get momentum, but you can't get a vaccine, your friends can't get a vaccine, and it's another year 
before your country's even gotten its its full sort of COVAX, that's the global um, vaccine alliance, its full COVAX distribution, which is what some of the projections are suggesting, um, then you've got all this goodwill that's almost squandered. And so I, I think I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about this because there is a tension between building enthusiasm for the vaccine when you don't have shots that you can put in people's arms. And I think that one of the things that's really important is building demand while also building supply. And so that's where I think removing the patents, investing, whether it's global money or regional money, I don't care whose money it is, but investing in, in vaccine production at the regional level so that African countries aren't dependent on AstraZeneca being produced in Europe or in India or in China, but actually there's a healthy and robust pharmaceutical and vaccine industry across the continent. You can then pivot that after COVID, which will eventually, there will be an after COVID someday, um, pivot that to things like human animal health vaccines, other things that have otherwise been called neglected tropical diseases because they affect countries across Africa, but they don't affect the wealthy global Northern and European countries. Um, so I would like to see there that in that shift towards investing in local production, not every country, right? Still complementarity, but if three or four countries in the continent can produce the vaccines required for all of Africa, then you can match demand and supply, but having demand outstrip supply and then having people wait, I think will will lead to um, mistrust and, and sort of willful skepticism. But what are your thoughts? Or maybe Alfred's with us, he can tell us his thoughts about the role of young. Absolutely, I'll be more than happy to weigh in on, on that. But um, since we do have Alfred, Alfred, um, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Raymond, um, so I was saying that when it comes to, to COVID, what COVID has done to nations and communities is it has caught communities by supplies in, in such a way that it has come as an accelerator where it has shown the existing problems that we, we do have in the communities. For instance, you, you find out that um, most of the people could, uh, could ignore the statistics that have been there all along. For example, we have like high digital illiteracy levels when it comes to, to young women and girls and even um, uh, the youth. But then communities have been not paying attention to such kind of data. So what COVID-19 has done has... Uh, unfortunately, we seem to have um, dropped um, 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 Alfred again, um, but uh, we will we will continue. He did mention something that is, I think, very important. Um, earlier, I mentioned that there is not a single African story, um, because from a national perspective, the structure of the economies um, um, differ. Also, from a community perspective, um, youth who are women have a different reality than youth who are male. Youth who are displaced have a different reality from those who are not. And so how do we um, embrace this diversity such that we are not leaving any youth or any Africa behind as we build forward stronger after COVID-19? But we seem to have um, Alfred again. Um, please, could you take her from where you left off? We're going to take this in sections and um, hopefully get your entire remarks um, during this session. Please go ahead, Alfred. So uh, what, what COVID-19 has done is, ha has made people realize, has made youth realize and community realize that all along there have been that Okay, um, I, he has um, dropped again. Um, so there is a gendered perspective as well, and we'll come back um, to, to that. But let me just take off from where you left off from the last time, Zoe, relating to um, vaccine availability, affordability, and distribution across the continent. Um, this, I think, is absolutely key. We need to find a way not just to make them available, but also to make them accessible and affordable. Um, across uh, the continent, um, there is a very important youth dimension here because um, most people believe that um, because of COVID, 
we have accelerated the adoption of um, digital solutions by about 10 years. We're now thinking, working, um, interacting digitally a lot more than we would have if we had not. And what we find, particularly across Africa, is the fact that we have young people um, being the change agents. And I do believe that in not just in terms of messaging, ensuring that people understand that the vaccines are safe, that the vaccines are the gateway or the pathway to um, sustainable um, recovery, but people like um, Alfred, who are who are in mobile application entrepreneurs, could think about way to address not just the messaging, but also the logistics issue. Um, you think about the size and the infrastructure challenges across Africa, there must there have to be digital solutions that young people could use to ensure that we know where um, vaccines are needed and how much is needed and when they are needed. And so getting the young people involved in this in the logistical, in solving the logistical challenges through digitization, I think is one important um, thing that we need to put on the table. Um, secondly, we have seen, and um, Senegal is an example of this, um, partnerships between pharmaceutical um, industries in Africa and those outside Africa. In Senegal, it was with a UK um, related um, um, entity where we're beginning to see the um, the um, local pr production of um, PPEs, et cetera. But we need to go beyond that. We need to, because we know that um, COVID is going to be in Africa, in the world for a, a while, COVID is going to mutate. And so the demand for COVID vaccines is not just um, an issue of this particular um, season. And so thinking ahead, um, and working, of course, with the Africa CDC, how do we start ensuring that we have production on the continent? And this is not just an issue of vaccine nationalism, it's a practical issue of when we have a, when we have a, a mutation, when we have a wave to get the vaccines where they need to get as quickly as possible. And that yeah. is, again, that, that is again another um, big challenge that um, another big challenge that Africa has, but we're beginning to see not just in the use of um, technology for messaging and, and logistics, but also in the use of the technology for accountability. Um, we need to ensure that the health care, um, the health sector is accountable. Um, not just to um, the donors or the government, but accountable to the people. And at a community level, we need to have an interface. And I think that this um, virtual interface that has really quickly evolved because of COVID could be a positive, um, a positive um, element in uh, making and bringing this to um, bear. Um, so. So let me come back to you. Um, Alfred mentioned that um, there are gendered um, perspectives to COVID in Africa. Um, how do you think we could um, address these issues? Is this a really great way to um, kickstart the sort of um, societal and socioeconomic transformation that we all believe has been long overdue? I mean, the, there's so much to talk about. I'm so glad that I'll... he started by talking about the, the data um, and digital literacy gap, right? That young women and adult women have less access to mobile devices. They're more often controlled, if not outright owned by the men in the family. Um, so there's an access to, you know, basically the phone in your pocket. Um, there's also an access issue when it comes to uh, inequalities in poverty and spending habits that women may not have as much, you know, basically top up and access to data for things like streaming content or WhatsApp messaging. And so there are some things about kind of even just using the devices that leads to this, this digital literacy gap and, and lack of 
confidence at least in um, accessing information, accessing, you know, social media and, and apps. And a lot of information travels that way now, right? It's, it's, it's a sort of um, the new radio, right? Um, and so when women and girls don't have equal access, that means there's lack of equal access to not only information and social networks and news and access to things like vaccines and public health messaging, but also lack of access to digital banking solutions to um, agricultural market information to, to medical apps. And so a lot of the kind of innovations that, as you mentioned, Raymond, have been accelerated, where uptake has increased because of COVID and because of lockdowns, um, women and girls are at risk of being left behind if we can't close that digital literacy gap. But there are some other more um, mundane, if I can say, ways that girls might be disadvantaged. So one thing that I was doing last summer is I was working with a team of students along alongside the Ministry for Basic and Senior Secondary Education in Sierra Leone, because the Sierra Leonean leadership was particularly worried about girls not coming back into school at the same rate as boys after COVID. So when we saw schools shut down, there's a risk that girls will be left behind because they're um, not only at risk of pregnancy, where they're likely to not return to school if they become pregnant or have a child during the lockdown, but they're also more likely to kind of get swept in to household tasks, taking care of their children, et cetera. And so the most, the single most important thing that we need to do for women's access to the labor market and to economic equality and freedom between women and men is really for women to have relief and support from some of their care responsibilities at the home. So women work up to 10 times as many hours taking care of children, taking care of household chores and tasks as men do. And what that means is those are hours that they either can't be at their workplace or at the market or starting an innovative business. Um, they have to be caring for their families. And that's not a, a natural state of things. That's a sort of social norm that we have the power to change. And one of the ways that we can do that is by coordinating things like childcare. There's a lot of coordination of care that happens in the same apartment block. Um, and I think that we need to sort of lean into that and consider formalizing it so that women's economic potential, but also creative and political potential can be fully unlocked. And one of the sort of last things I'll say is the, the most efficient way to do that is by providing direct access to electricity and water, which is otherwise a huge time burden, particularly in rural areas. But if you provide light and you provide water, that increases hygiene, it increases schooling levels, it increases success, and it increases business dynamism at the, at the very household level, right? And so I think that these are the types of infrastructure investments, whether they're through microgrids, so at the small level, or through national grids, depends on the context, depends on the country. Um, but I'd love to see that happen as part of the rebuilding effort, because if we continue to have massive inequalities in access to light and water, we're going to continue to have inequalities and vulnerability to disease transmission and in lack of access to employment. No, no, thank you so much. Um, and as you rightly, as you pointed out um, in your earlier remarks, um, Africa saw a GDP um, slump this year, uh, first time in 25 years. Um, UNDP's Human Development Index fell for the first time ever. And it is critical to understand how COVID could not just affect development, but reverse development in many areas, uh, not just in aggregate terms, but when you break it down according to gender. Um, Zoe, you are an educator. So the question from Abiodun Ofalabi, um, I think is appropriate. Um, he, be, he says that um, COVID has disrupted education in Africa. And he's worried that um, this move towards virtual education would lead to what he calls cultural imperialism, with um, many people be who can't afford or don't have access um, to uh, virtual learning being left behind, and also um, the worry that um, learning then becomes more individualistic than communal. What what would your re response be to um, Abiodun? <laughs> 
That is such a brilliant question. Thank you so much, Abby Oden, for bringing the sort of the role of cultural imperialism and individualism versus communalism to our attention. Um, I think there are ways to blend edutech, as you call it, so technology for education or technology assisted learning into what we think of as more sort of traditional or grassroots or community-based learning. And so one thing is to think about the ways that technologically assisted learning can be an add-on to regular schooling that happens in communities. And another way to think about it is um, to think about all of the tutoring and kind of study groups that happen as a complement to technology-driven learning, where you need to rely on technology because of lockdowns or because of public health restrictions. That doesn't mean that you can't have pods of learners at the local level with safe social distancing who are complementing the, the sort of technology to ensure that there's still that peer learning. Because more than thinking about a kind of dichotomy or a divide between the individual and the communal, as an educator, the thing that's most important to me is that you can't actually learn alone. You always learn best when you communicate with others. And so even for medical doctors in medical training, they have this thing where you, you see one, you do one, and then you teach one. And I think it applies to everything, right? So the first time that you're learning something as a doctor, you're supposed to see someone else do it. This is like apprenticeship. Then you do it yourself, and then you teach someone else. And so as we think about any sort of kind of learning opportunity, we need to remember that without peers, without application, without group projects and collective kind of learning, that learning is stunted, right? You're not going to learn as much. Um, I also think that and just, I want to get to Alfred because I see he's back with us, but the, the earlier remarks I made about the digital divide in terms of the gender gap and the digital divide in terms of access, not only to electricity, but in terms of access to data, if you're using um, any technology that relies on a data network or a cell network, there's, there's a potential for technology to accelerate achievement gaps and education and learning gaps more generally. And so I think it's important for uh, ministries of education, for local communities to be mindful mindful of having a right-sized technology that doesn't leave part of the country behind or those in um, urban settlements who don't have access to regular power or don't have access to a data plan behind. And so I think that local ownership of education technology is really quite possible, but it's also, you know, I have too many friends who are teachers in African countries to not put in a plug for like paying our teachers and not having to have teacher strikes, right? That there, there are other kind of basic things that African governments still have to solve. We can't have ghost teachers who don't exist. We can't have teachers um, harassing their female students in order to give them the grades they've earned. And we also need to ensure that teachers are properly paid because we know that they're venerated in African societies. And I don't wanna lose that because Facebook distributed tablets, for example. But these things can go together and create really powerful synergies. Okay, thank you so much, um, Zoe. We do have Alfred back. Um, Alfred, let me um, pose a question to you that um, Game Bansi asked. Um, you are a model, you're a mobile application developer. You understand the um, digital solutions world. Um, Game is saying, why should we really be focusing on digital solutions when most people on the continent are struggling for clean water and food? All right. Um, so I, I, I would say technology, as it stands for now, you, you will find out that it's playing a role almost in each and every sector being in water, being in um, transportation, being in agriculture, being in health, being in ed education. So what we need to focus much on when it comes to, to why technology, why digital space, uh, focusing on other things where people are struggling. The reason is when it comes to uh, technology, it can enable those who are even marginalized to access the resources that are in far places. So for, for technology and those people able to adopt it, you would find out that if we are able to adopt technology, we can use that technology to our advantage. So that technology can be used, for example, in the water sector, can be used in the agricultural sector. And from what COVID has shown, you will find out that um, it has clearly shown that gap that is there when it comes to, to the digital. So there is need for us to pay attention to, to this, uh, to this type.
at the end of the day, you would find out that COVID has demanded much people to, to go on, uh, to use technology than using the traditional ways of doing things. So there is need for us to use that to address water problems. How can we use this technology to address uh, let's say agricultural problems? How can we use this technology to address healthy problems? Because at the end of the day, it will be this technology that will act as an enabler to these people. So the challenge that we have, as much as water problems are there, you might find out that uh, they have been there for so long and people have been working to solve these kind of challenges. Then the gap, how do we then allow people to use technology to access that? How do we then make them continue to enjoy using technology uh, to access the services that, that we have? I'll give an example. You find out that um, what COVID-19 has done is there is what is known as uh, a restriction in physical meetings. And that has given room to people to adopt to online stuff. So for those who already have knowledge in terms of, let's say, e-commerce, they are still able to buy online and have deliveries because there is no direct content. Meaning that if we can train more people in the digital space, they can be able to use mobile phones for their better goods. Uh, thank you so much, um, um, Alfred. I really do agree with you and Zoe. Um, digitization is an is and could be an enabler um, because there are many um, challenges that African societies face. One could be remoteness. The villages are too far away. And so with digitization, you can bring um, education to um, far flung areas. You could also use digitization to um, address a lot of the um, institutional bureaucracies that would add costs and time to processes. And, uh, but this requires a lot of thought and uh, we are seeing um, with um, the COVID response, um, and African countries have all developed what, uh, what are called socioeconomic response plans, um, good ideas to bounce back. Um, but how many of these actually um, highlight some of the challenges of and con potential contributions by the youth? I would argue that not enough um, but um, Alfred, if you had to advise a government um, today who are preparing a new COVID response plan, how would, what would you tell them that would enable them to incorporate the youth and youth related issues um, more robustly? So, um... For the government that are designing a recovery plan, not only for nations and communities, but as uh, the nation and, uh, and the globe, what we need to focus on and what they need to focus on is uh, it demands action and innovativeness. And this action and innovativeness uh, mostly um, is something that the youth have. They're always curious about ideas they are always uh, thinking out, outside the box. And that's one aspect that um, the top officials should be able to put in place and consider the youth to say, okay, when it comes to COVID-19, COVID-19 is action oriented. It requires uh, people to work on the ground. It requires people to think outside the box. It no, uh, we've, we've lost Alfred, but I do, um agree with him that um, COVID-19 forces us to rethink and to re-engineer development. Um, same question to you, Zoe. If you had to advise multilateral organizations uh, across the world or donor agencies, how, how would they become more relevant to um, youth concerns in a post-COVID um, world? Alfred's final thoughts, and then I'll come to that question while he's with us. Alfred, did you want to finish your thought? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I was saying that COVID-19 requires, I would say, action-oriented and thinking outside the box. And 
uh, at the center of that. They always they always have this energy. They're always thinking outside the box. So the matrilaterals and even the government uh, or top officials, they should consider these factors that they need to have a vibrant population, which is always thinking. And the youth provide this opportunity for them. I'll give an example for Malawi. You'll find out that um, most of the youth we are the ones active on the ground, coming up with innovative ways of how best they can they can mitigate the challenges that COVID has um, has imposed in, in communities and the nation at large. So I, I, I would say that if, uh, there is need for energy, there is need for uh, innovativeness, there is need for action oriented, and this is what exactly the youth are providing to them. Thank you very much, Alfred. Um, Zoe. I'm glad I got a couple of minutes to think about my answer because it's a, it's a tough one. I mean, I think ultimately the only way that um, third party organizations, whether they're international governments, even some of the regional governance organizations or NGOs and, and foundations, they really need to have youth representation. I mean, there's no way to center a youth perspective without actually empowering young people to be in the room at the decision-making table, understanding the trade-offs, thinking about the costs and benefits of different um, permutations, different sets of solutions. And I think that there's a lot of potential to do this. This is also a case that I make when it comes to gender equity and gender justice, is that you can't think about women's issues without having women at the table. And it's not just one woman and one youth representative, which we know is the traditional model. And then they don't come because they actually aren't paid to be there. They don't have the financial support and they have other things that they need to do for their daily living. And so it's about having multiple youth representatives, multiple women representatives, and to, to try to be innovative. Think about having um, I see a, a question in the chat from Game Bansi again. A think about having a citizens council. Think about having a citizens oversight board or, um, you know, a, a community justice organization that's looking at the proposals and giving their constructive feedback. And then also think about what value are they adding if they're the people who are making sure that this is going to work when it actually launches, that implementation goes according to plan, or even better, that we can and adjust implementation when it's not going according to plan because you have the sort of citizens council or citizens oversight board, then you should pay them for that um, value addition that they're bringing. And so I would say the first and you know, most important thing is to have youth representation, youth inclusion in these decision-making efforts and in these planning efforts. But then more broadly, I think that one of the things, Raymond, that's really important to not underestimate is the importance of five and 10 year planning. Right, because you can't make any sort of COVID recovery plan that looks at the next 12 months or even the next 24 months. If you start to think about where are we going to be in five and 10 years, that's when you can really begin to offset these long and drawn out costs and consequences of a slow recovery or of a delayed recovery. Um, and this is true on both the health front in terms of thinking of health holistically and not just COVID prevention, but also maternal mortality prevention, um, preventative disease, et cetera and thinking about the economic side of things. And in 10 years, that 20 year old young person or that 15 year old young person, they're 25 and 35. They have a family to support. They've gone through their graduate education. They're a doctor, you know? And so then you can actually think about modeling your recovery to harness their full potential. I think sometimes, you know, old habits die hard. We think that an 18 year old is just an 18 year old. We forget an 18 year old is not only working and supporting their, you know, younger brothers and sisters educational achievement and going to school, but they're also getting ready to start a business. They're saving so that they can launch a small enterprise or even a mid-sized enterprise. Maybe they're working for their neighbor down the street who's gonna one day hand over the management of a factory to them. And so, really Really thinking with that medium term time horizon, I think, is the other piece of the puzzle, representation and then planning for their um, full success. And, and young people need to also be talking in those terms, right? There's a, a kind of counterpart, which is it's, it's not just on older people to seed space, to give space and opportunities, but it's also on young people to say, this is essential for me so that I can be here in five years there in 10 years, breaking out of the sort of um, tomorrowism and really thinking about tomorrow is a long time horizon. It's not just a short time horizon. And that, that's hard when you're struggling to survive. And so I, I recognize that it's challenging, but this is the group, Yali is the group of people who can have those visioning 
questions. You can think about where do I need to be today if I want to get to this place tomorrow? And you figure it out by working backwards, by planning backwards about where you need to be today. Uh, thank you so much, um, Zoe. I, you know, point well made. Um, we need to really think about how we um, have a plan and not just an immediate response. Um, one that incorporates not just the um, imperatives of today, but the reality that um, our vision stretches out um, um, from a sustainable development goal vision, we can say 2030, from the African Union's vision, we can say the Africa we want by 2063. Um, either way, um, the visioning issue is um, is, is really um, important. Um, let me just add to your response to um, Game Bansi about you know what recourse is there for um, communities and young people when they see mismanagement, uh, particularly with um, COVID uh, vaccines and supplies. And I think that um, this is the point that both Alfred and Zoe have made, um, that um, engagement goes beyond advocacy. It's basically getting involved um, and um, using social media to have platforms for accountability um, also being um, vocal um, advocates for doing the right thing. Um, is that going to solve all the problems? No, but it will at least um, shed light on the issues and put the people on who are, in, uh, in your example, um, mismanaging um, COVID response on the, on, on the spot. And because we need that part, uh, that as part of a uh, you know a democratized uh, a democratization of um, responsibility, where we all get involved, um, you know whether we are youth or whether we are um, a, a lot older. Um, someone said that all good things um, come to an end. Uh, we are running out of time, but I want to um, ask you, um, Alfred and Zoe, in. 60 seconds or less, is there one thing that you have seen being done either by youth or for youth that you think is sound practice that others could um, learn from when it comes to um, building forward after COVID? I'll ask you to go first, um, Alfred, since we have you. One example of a good thing that could be replicated. Um, the first thing is there have been an apply in mobile application development de developments in my country. The use of uh, mobile technology. For example, we had uh, a group of youth who were working on solutions from disinfecting uh, disinfecting markets to access to information and even in the education space. So this is something that I do believe that youth, even in different communities, they should be able to, to embrace. They should also embrace the digital economy. Uh, like for Malawi, there have been a lot of uh, development in terms of online payment systems to enable the people in local areas and even in the able to pay things online, a thing which was not there before. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Alfred and Zoe. Yeah, this is a great question. You know, I'm going to do something I don't usually do. Normally, I'm very practical and hands-on and specific. And I actually think what I want to end on is um, truly the most important thing that youth have to offer across African countries. I've never been in an African country where this isn't true, although there is some variation depending on the local narratives about unemployment. But most importantly, young people in COVID, before COVID, in war zones, in post-conflict reconstruction, they believe anything is possible. And I think this is why they hold governments to account. They're not jaded. They're not cynical. They don't think, oh, of course, half of the COVAX vaccines are going to go missing because corruption happens every time. No, they think that we have this many COVID vaccines, we need to get more. And all of those COVID vaccines should get in people's arms. They think that everyone should have access to banking. They think that no matter how little money they have to put away, saving is possible. And there is the sort of infinite potential for the economy to grow and transform. And I personally think that young people are right. I think all of that is true, and I want youth to hold on to that optimism and to really apply it in their daily conversations 
in public discourse and in who they vote for and how they hold those politicians accountable and also in the types of social enterprises and companies they build. I want young people to hire young people. I want women to hire other women and I want us to sort of be the change that's required to achieve Agenda 2063, the AU vision that you mentioned and all of the sustainable development goals. It will be through young people's continued optimism um, that we actually achieve our wildest dreams across the continent. Uh, thank you so much, um, Alfred, and thank you, Zoe. Um, today's conversation has been about COVID-19 disruption and innovation in Africa. Um, fundamentally, it's all about YALI, young African leaders. And there are four things I'd like to end with. First, as YALI, get involved. Help reshape the narrative and construct and reimagine the policy debate. Secondly, Capitalize on your advantage. Use digitization and technology to help address the economic, the social, the environmental, and the political um, opportunities um, that COVID will provide. Thirdly, promote equity and sustainability. We have to champion sustainable change, and we also have to champion inclusive growth. Um, fourthly, democratize leadership um, because quite often, as the panelists have rightly pointed out, um, we see um, youth either as tokens around the table or as marginalized groups that are to be feared. Um, you have to be part of leadership um, because building back from COVID and building forward, having a vision um, for a much uh, different Africa a healthier, more prosperous, and sustainable continent requires everything that um, you can bring to the table. As I said earlier, there is no one COVID story in Africa, and there is no single solution that's going to solve everything. This is going to take all of us um, doing it together. Let me close once again by thanking um, Dr. Zoe Marx, lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School, and Mr. Alfred Kankuzi, who is a YALI alumnus and also founder and CEO of multiple enterprises um, in Malawi. And thank also the Wilson Center and the US Department of State for bringing us all together. Thank you for your participation and for your excellent questions. Goodbye.